And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Revelation chapter 13. You know, this is probably one of the most important chapters in our Father's Word. Remember, God never creates anything that it's, that's malformed, okay? Our pollution and other things through uh, natural birth occasionally do, but He didn't, he didn't create any multi-headed creatures. That's symbolism, and He expects you to be intelligent enough to understand symbolism. It mean, if it's multi-headed, what does that mean? It's political, okay? It's a political system. A political system has many heads. And um, many times, if it's a dictatorship, of course, supposedly it only has one, but there's still many heads. Satan is coming with ten rulers that he intends to install. They are supernatural. They are fallen angels. And they will be established in his government, which will be known as the spurious Messiah. Most people, if they're not careful, will think it is Christ returned, establishing His kingdom. Therefore, one needs to be familiar with our Father's Word, this great book of Revelation, meaning, the, what does the word Revelation mean? Any, anyone should know. It means to reveal something, to make it known. Quite contrary, you have some people, I don't know if it's because they don't understand it or what, but they will say, it's not meant to be understood. Well, then why did God have it named the Revelation, the revealing? The Greek word means the uncovering, the unveiling. You're supposed to know, all right? So, having said that, we have here a system that rose from the sea, and you'll find out in the seventh chapter that waters or sea are peoples. This naturally, a political system rises from the people, made up from the people, and in this case, over the people. And uh, a deadly wound was received. What happens, this doesn't happen to an individual, it happens to a political system. And then, presto, the spurious Messiah shows up and heals the political wound of one worldism, and everything is hunky dory. Everything is a okay. We got a chicken in every pot. Everyone's, he, as it's written in the book of Daniel, he comes in prosperously and peacefully. That's kind of a hard thing to fight against, friend. Even though it is Satan, and most people are expecting Messiah to fly him away before, uh, you know, the Antichrist comes, they're not even going to be aware that it's the Antichrist they're worshiping. But that's the way it is. God sent the letter. If they don't understand it, if they haven't read it, if they're biblically illiterate in this high-tech uh, generation, I feel sorry for them, all right? So with that having been said, chapter 13, verse 7, let's pick it up. Let's go with it to complete this chapter. Verse 7, and it reads, And it was given unto him to make war, this is to say the dragon, with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That means a one world system. That's all it means. Now, who is this dragon? Do you, do you remember back in the, um, the ninth verse of the last chapter 9, that, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan? Don't, don't ever let anybody pull your leg on that. We're talking about Satan de facto upon this earth. Michael boots him out, and here he is. What are you going to do about it? What you're going to do if you love your father, what he has instructed you to do. I guess the question is, have you read it? Okay, it's that simple. Verse 8, And all, how many? All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. There is an exception. Here's the exception. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain, what lamb was slain? Well, Christ, of course, on the cross. From the foundation of the world. 
the Greek verb katabo, many of you are familiar with that, the fact that God's elect were chosen before the first, that is to say the original overthrow. That's what foundation katabo. You with companion Bibles make a mental note of Appendix 146. It's important that you understand the ages and then you understand how did your name get written? How, how, why did, how did it come to be there? Well, it's not free. You earned it, okay? So uh, all that don't know better, all that don't have the seal of God in their forehead, well, what's that? Well, what's in your forehead? Your brain is. Use it. In other words, if you have God's truth in your mind, you know this fake is coming first. You know you're not going to be the first one taken in that field as it's written in Matthew 24 when it says Christ is teaching and he said the Antichrist is coming first and there will be two women in a field and one will be taken and the other will stay on the job. The one that's taken is taken by Antichrist. You don't want to be in that part. Is your name written in that book? Do you understand the truth? Do you know our Father's Word? You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, and I'm not trying to intimidate you or talk down to you or anything else. If you allow God's Word to flow, minus the traditions of men, a child can understand it. True wisdom is to take away clutter, uh, traditions, and sim let the simplicity of Christ's teachings flow. So, quite simply, those that know the truth are not going to be sucked in by this one. They're not going to be deceived. You couldn't deceive them in any way, shape, or form. And for the deeper student, Katabo, he didn't cut it in the first earth age as we read in chapter 12 when he had this same political system in the first earth age. All right? Uh, end of subject, continue. Verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Do you have an ear? It means simply an ear for hearing truth, discernment, to know when something doesn't fly, won't work. Yes, our Father uses symbolism, but, you know, um, an object lesson, or, you know, for to use objects to teach a lesson, let's put it that way, that's, that's done every day in schools across the country. In kin from kindergarten on up. That's all symbolism is in a sense, all right? Verse 10, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, this, this is an old Hebrew idiom. And translated from the text, it would read something like, he that is destined, in other words, there's destiny in it, he that is destined because of his works for the sword, hey, he's going to get the sword. And he that is destined for captivity, he's going captive. Um, I, I want you to turn with me, if you will, to... Um, to Jeremiah chapter 43. I, I want to give you this, this. This has to do with the king of Babylon who happened to be Nebuchadnezzar at this time, but he is a type of the king of Babylon as a false Christ. And this, uh, I, Jeremiah chapter 43 verse 11 has this same old Hebrew uh, idiom. Uh, listen to it. It is pretty well, it's translated very well. Listen to it carefully. And when he cometh, that being the the uh, king of Babylon, or even Antichrist, if you like, because it was a type of what that would be, cometh, he shall smite the land of Egypt and deliver such as are for death to death, and such as are for captivity to captivity, and such as, uh, as are for the sword to the sword. Now, what are these swords in the end time? You know, we have read that in first, the first chapter of this great book of Revelation in verse 15 and 16, that Christ's tongue is a two-edged sword. Hey, his sword will chop you up pretty good. His, that means his truth cuts both ways. That's why it's double-edged. His truth will wound the lies of Satan. 
to be held captive by Christ, that's a, cap, that's a captivity that is whereby the chains are chains of love. If you love our Father, He's got you captive. And it is love that binds or that imprisons you. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good captivity. But if that flood of lies, as we learned of in chapter 12, that Satan pours out after the woman, meaning our people, our brothers and sisters, God's children, when he pours that flood of lies out that comes from his mouth, I hope you're not held captive by that. In other words, do you understand now how there is destiny within this? It means that what you do establishes your destiny. Whether you're going up or down, I'll use that terminology. Uh, whether you're going to heaven or hell, let's just say it like it is. It's your ship, friend. Many people will advise you. Many people will give you that advice. You will read. And the decision that you make personally, I don't care who is advising you, you must decide establishes your destiny, even your eternal destiny. That's what is involved within this. It means it's your life. If you establish yourself to be in that book of life, be there. Don't worry about where your church letter is. Have your letter in heaven. That's where the books count, okay? And, and I'm not, I don't say that to offend some church or anything. It's just that that letter is not going to do you any good whenever this book is opened. Necessi well, I wouldn't say that, but you, know, you understand what I mean. I doubt that God mentions it. It's what you have done, the decisions you have made on your actions creates what will be determined by the chief judge, which is to say Almighty God. Don't judge wrong. Don't let the lies of Satan, that's what he's saying here, captivate you, whereby the sword of the Lord, instead of a sword of love, is a sword that could bring about a deadly wound. Verse 11, as we continue, okay? And it reads... And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. In other words, it looked like Jesus Christ. It looked like that lamb slain we were talking about back in verse 8. But he's got the voice of the dragon. Why? It is the dragon. This particular beast is a religious beast. Right? It's not multi-headed. It looks like the Lamb of God. He even claims to be the Lamb of God, as we reiterated from chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians in the last lecture. He says, I am God. Now, are you going to believe it? You see, your destiny is involved within this. If you were to believe this first Lamb that has the voice of the dragon, that's not Christ, that is instead of Christ. And he does come first. He comes at the sixth trump. The true Christ comes at the seventh. Can you count? It's that simple. So here you have him de facto. Michael has booted him out of heaven as he stated he would, stated he would in chapter 12, verse 9. He is de facto up on earth, not an evil spirit, but in person. That old dragon, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, little horn, son of perdition, whatever name he tries to wiggle into, whatever crack he tries to wiggle into to hide his uh, 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 personality, to finagle, lie, cheat, steal. But yet he comes in as the prince of peace. Verse 12. And he exerciseth, that's this religious spurious Messiah, Lamb, exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, that's to say the one world, the political system and its structure, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship 
the first beast, that's to say to gladly become a patriot of his one world government. I mean, a free pie in every pot, a free chicken in every pot. As the great book of Daniel reiterates, peacefully and prosperously. He can make it on that, friend. Whose deadly wound was healed, that political system that he saved. And, you know, many might say, well, how in the world could he pay off all the debts for all the money that people owe? How could he possibly do that? Well, l let's be real for a moment. Uh, take, take a dollar bill out of your pocket and look closely at it. In reality, what is it? Well, it's a piece of paper. What's it worth? Well, it's worth whatever whoever is backing it says it's worth. But it in itself has no value whatsoever. You might fan yourself with it. So if a one world leader comes in and says, I'm establishing a new government and a new currency, what you have, it's all yours. Just whatever you're owed, forget it. It's done. And we're starting all over with everybody having everything. You know, how much would be lost in a paper pile? Now, I, I know I, I will have some uh, financial experts, just economists, just going in circles here. But hey, get real, friend. Okay. Pull it out, look at it, bite it, and see what you bite into. When when his government takes over, you're either a part of it or that old piece of paper is worthless and the notes and all that kind of stuff, that's all past history. It's all a new ball game with a new government, his. He had it in the first earth age. Hey, it worked real good for him because when you read his government from the first earth age in, in uh, Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, you find very little difference in the one he exercises or brings to power in this earth age in 13, 1 and 2 of this great book. Have you ever noticed the difference? Three crowns, that's all. Let's go on with the next verse, okay? This religious beast, the verse 13, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, this is what you've got to be spiritually and mentally prepared for. The word fire here is P-U-R in the Hebrew, I'm sorry, the Greek, poor. And figuratively, literally it means fire, but figuratively it means lightning. Open your Strong's Concordance, take a look at it. I'm talking about a complete Strong's. He figuratively, lightning. He can snap his fingers and lightning. What do you think that would do to a crowd today? Hmm? Like I said, you got, he's supernatural. And God allows certain powers that he is able to utilize. Did we not read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that God said, because he said, don't you worry about Christ returning? There's no way he's going to return until after the son of perdition stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God, Jesus, and God himself said in verses 9, 10, and 11, because people want to believe a lie, I will send them strong delusion. Snapping fingers, lightning coming down, that's a pretty strong delusion, friend. God's going to allow it. If people want to be ignorant, he'll let, he'll let you. Why? That's your destiny if you choose that route. But when you have the truth of God in your forehead, your mind, you know beforehand that he has, the, he has this ability. It's not going to fool you. You're not tempted by it. Therefore, you escape the hour of temptation. Now, you got a bunch of yo-yo reverends that when they read, uh, you will escape the hour of temptation, they say, are you going to fly away? No, that, that's not what God's Word says. God says in, in Ezekiel 13, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. He said, they sew kerchiefs to, to cover my outreaching, saving hands 
of truth with lies. No, you know, our Father protects his own. This is why that he, in the great book of Daniel, which I'm glad we taught Daniel before this book, do you know why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't burned or even singed in the fiery furnace? Because Christ was walking with them. He's supernatural. He protects his own. Satan can't bother you. As, as it is written in Luke chapter 10, verse uh, uh, 13, verse 19 through about 20, Christ gives you power not over all flesh, but he gives you power over all spirits, including the evil spirit of Satan. But you have to have the faith and the brass to stand up and utilize that power and that authority. I don't know, do you? Sure you do. Why? Christ gave it to you. But it's in here, in your mind, where your brain becomes informed with this letter God has written to you, allowing you to know what tomorrow brings. You know, man only fears the unknown. I am glad that our Father allowed Psalms 22 to be placed in this great Bible, letting us know detail by t detail what would be happening at the foot of the cross while Christ was nailed to it a thousand years before it happened, even down to the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing. Man can't do that. So it documents to an intelligent person, our Father knows what he's doing. Our Father forewarns those that care to take the time. So, hey, he's going to perform some miracles that you need to be prepared for. Then you would better understand why Jesus would say in Mark 13, for the elect's sake I've shortened the time of Satan's rule on earth, otherwise there would be no flesh saved. Why? He's that convincing. I don't believe it's possible that one of God's elect will be deceived by that person, that entity. Why? We don't find him tempting. We find him to be an abomination. Verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Now keep this straight in your mind which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, I'm going to draw on two or three points within this. Um, who is the beast that received the deadly wound? The political system. Well, what did, what did he who could perform these miracles, why, why did he want them to worship it? Because it's his government. It's his one world system. He brought 10 of those supernatural kings with him to place over the earth, like it or lump it. It, it shall happen. Now, this might let you know, we know now that the beast, the political system, was wounded by a sword. I, I wonder, wonder what in the world kind of sword that could be. Well, I'd advise you to read Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 all over again. It's the sword of the Lord. It's his word taught by his people. Seeds planted by the children will bring about a wound. I could say those Christians that are informed will not allow the one world system to come into being when it endangers their freedoms and their constitution. But Satan will fix that. Thank God it will only last a short system, a short time. His system shall be. Why? It's written it's going to be. Do we have to worry? Absolutely not. Why? We have power over all supernatural entities given to us by Jesus Christ in His name, not our name, His name. We don't have to fear. Why? We know what their game is. We know what they're up to. But He's going to make His one world system, and He's going to make people be so patriotic. Well, how will He get them to worship it, paying their bills? Yeah, people will, 
if you if you owed a hundred thousand dollars on a home and he said hey, my dear friend because you love me here let's just tear this up uh, that doesn't mean anything to him and well we're going to have some people crying that that to uh, loan this money well I wouldn't worry too much about it uh, many of those that maybe some of the loan is made are, are glad to see him because it's their daddy okay verse 15 and he had power to give life I repeat he had power to give life um, and um, uh, or breath or even soul if you like unto the image of the beast he he made it live he made it real he made it the ruling power but that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed as many as would not worship it they're going to try to bring them killed what kind of kill this is spiritual friend a spiritual death is for one who truly loves Christ to take part in the great apostasy that means the falling away and begin to worship this Satan rather than the true Christ that's a spiritual death you're dead as a matter of fact that borders very close to the unpardonable sin that those written even in the book before the foundation can commit I don't believe it'll ever happen why we don't find Satan tempting. The hour of temptation, we totally escape because we find him an abomination. Look what he's doing to your children today. Look what he's doing to the world today. Young kids blowing themselves up in the name of religion. You don't have to worry that much. You're not going to die a spiritual death. You're going to serve the living God. Verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. I mean, status has nothing to do with this. Place in life has nothing to do with it. To receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. The Greek is E. You know what? how you spell in in Greek? E-N. Here we spell it I-N. Well, it still means the same thing. Now, Again, what's in your forehead, your brain? What is what did, would, did Jesus say back in Revelation chapter nine, verse four? He told Satan, "You can go down there and you can sting and confuse every soul except those that have the seal of God in their forehead." What's the seal of God? The truth of what Satan's up to. You can't deceive someone that's informed so naturally the mark of the beast in the forehead is people who are simply deceived by this crud I probably should I'm probably making an error and calling him a, a crud because he's a very beautiful beautiful individual and so convincing that an unlearned person is going to have no problem in loving him because he's all looks so ever intelligent sharp a deceiver of deceivers now I want you to be real though you've got people you're going to hear all kinds of people say they're going to make this little chip and they're going to insert this little chip in your forehead and you are going straight to hell uh, let, me, let me ask you so what kind of God do we serve somebody forces you to have special surgery and places a microchip under your skin does that change the way you believe you know, God judges you on how you believe alright do you think for one moment God would um, let's say Satan had a rodeo and we went out here and we roped a bunch of people and we branded them all right with put a patch on them do you think God had sent somebody to hell because Satan had a rodeo and roped them when they were kicking and pawing and screaming I'm using the analogy of an old-fashioned rodeo because I've been to a few of them those calves didn't have much of a chance of us 
deciding whether they wanted that brand or not, we gave it to them, all right? But that didn't change the way the calf felt. I guarantee you, he kicked, he bellered. He didn't like it. It didn't change his mind about anything. Well, neither would it an individual's, okay? Get real. God is fair. He judges people by what, how they, what they do. <clears throat> Excuse me, the destiny, verse uh, 9, that we covered. What you do and what you decide, that's your destiny, not what somebody might force on you. Uh, let's use another example. Paul was put in bonds. He held up his hands. He said, look at these chains, but I'm still teaching the Word of God. Do you think being in chains changed the way Paul thought? No. So, so just throw all that stuff, that cheap stuff out that people will bring about Yes, there's a little chip that is the mark of the beast. I can remember back many, many, many years ago when they said, there is a computer. Computers were new then in Belgium, and it is the beast. Well, that, that is the most ridiculous. I mean, people will buy in to anything. What he's saying is there's a new government, and to receive a, a valued paper or whatever from it, you've got to worship it. You've got to worship him, Okay. You can have anything you want. You can buy anything you want as long as you worship the system. As long as you become a patriot of the system. Uh, we can't do that, friend. Jesus would teach this again in another place in Mark 13 when he said, Woe to those that are with child and that give suck when I return. It meant those that uh, are impregnated in their mind spiritually by the lies and the false teachings and are even nursing along the work of Satan. That's why the mark in the hand is important. Not only do, are they marked in their mind, sealed by the lie, but their hands are forcing them to do Satan's work, not forcing them. They're enjoying doing Satan's work. Why? They think it's Jesus. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 17, and that no man may buy or sell save he that had the mark. I mean, if, if you weren't a patron of the new system, you, you don't have the money, friend. Your old money is no good. It's paper. That's why it's not bad to have a few little silver coins. Precious metal is always precious. And I'm not telling anyone to soak all their liquidity up in precious metal. All right, forget it or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Well, what does all that mean? Well, let's go to the next verse and find out. 18, here is wisdom. I don't know how much you got. Are you running on full or empty? Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. I'm going to save some of you a lot of time because if you're not pretty well, if you're not pretty well grounded in Greek, you're never going to find the word that is utilized here, okay, stigma. It's 55, six, uh, 5516 in your Greek dictionary of your Strong's Concordance. I'll say it again, 5516. What, what, it just gives you three letters, three Greek letters. Uh, that uh, grammatically uh, um, bring about the identification. But I want to draw your attention back to the word count. Sephos, it comes from the root, sephos, okay? Do you know what it's the same, that the root of this word count is the same word that we ran across earlier back in Revelation chapter two, where it is written he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Hidden manna is simply truth of God's word. I'll give you better understanding. And will give him a white stone. Now underline that word stone. That's what it is. The save holes. It's the same word as the word count. It comes from the same prime as the word count. 
and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. All, all it means is, is if you have God's truth in your forehead, you know what your rock is, and their rock is not our rock. We'll find that out in chapter 15. So wh what does this sephons mean then? Well, it means to enumerate with smooth worn stones of counting over a long period of time. That means watching Satan and his offspring all down through the years, the Kenites, to know where the Antichrist and who he's going to appear to in the end times. That's simple. Now, what about the 666? And I'll say a little more about this in the next lecture. Well, that's not difficult, all right? When, when the, this is talking about Satan making his entrance. What seal did Satan appear in? Well, it was the sixth. Well, isn't that amazing? Well, let me ask you another question. What trump did Satan appear in? Well, it was the sixth one. Well, isn't that amazing? Well, then what vial, which gives a 666, did he appear in? I just answered it, didn't I? Sixth. He appears in the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial. Why? Because chronologically, they run in order. And if you're familiar with your Father's Word, you know when He appears. You know the signs. You know what He's going to do. I mean, after all, didn't God just tell you He's going to set up His own little government? That, that shouldn't be too hard for anyone to spot. And really how you're really going to be identifying Him is He's going to be calling Himself Jesus, Christ, Christos. Only the, you've got to put the little Greek word anti, which doesn't mean the same as it does in English. In the Greek, anti means instead of. He's instead of Christ. He's the fake. See that you're not deceived. God couldn't really make it much simpler for one to understand if you throw out all the traditions you've heard and just listen to the Word of God and be a part of the sword, which is to say the truth, and it cuts through all the lies. God's two-edged, sharp sword coming from the tongue of the Word of God, Christ, cuts through all falsehood, and it settles it in your mind, whereby you are not soon shaken, for you have the stability of standing on the rock. Don't miss the next lecture. I'll say a little more about this then. Out of time, listen a moment, won't you please?